Joe Stepaniak, oh my goodness, how long I've known you, and you truly have had an impression on me over the years, unbeknownst to you perhaps, but believe me, after being a vegan myself for almost 35 years, I sought out those people I felt I could learn most from, and you were always, if I could be in one of your talks in a class, or if I could be looking at one of your cookbooks, believe me, I was doing it. So I, I just thank you for being willing to share a bit, believe me, in a few minutes it's only going to be a bit of what you hold uh, the, at the tip of your tongue in regard to having a really great whole foods plant-based diet. Uh, and you've done a lot of books of your own, as I said, and uh, perhaps you'll mention a few of them as you go along and uh, some of the favorite little things you like to cook out of it. But I really would like to, you to share first off what do you say to somebody when they first say to you, oh, you're vegan? I've been thinking about that, but how do I do it? Should I be vegan? So on. Well, I tell people that that's great. Uh, it's a wonderful way of living, a wonderful way of eating, a wonderful way of being, and that it's probably the best decision I ever made. Um, and I also tell them that they have to be personally motivated. To be vegan is, in a way, almost like quitting cigarettes. People can tell you what to do. They can tell you that something is that the cigarettes are very bad for you. You can read all the literature and you can know it for yourself. But until you have that inner motivation of your own, you're not going to do it and you're not going to stick with it. So when you find what that motivation is for you, whether it is for your health, whether it is for ethics, for caring and having compassion for animals, or whether it's for caring about the environment, once you find that key motivation, you are set. There's no turning back. And chances are, once you find that one motivation, the others will fall into place too. What was the motivation for you? For me, I became vegetarian as a very young girl, and oddly enough, people say to me, who inspired you? What was your motivation? How did you hear about it? Well, way back then, it really wasn't very easy to hear about vegetarianism. I grew up in a small town. I was the only vegetarian I knew, and I really didn't even know how to go about it. But I knew that there was, there was something, what I tell people, is something spoke to my heart. And I listened, and I followed, and I perhaps wasn't always the most perfect vegetarian, mm -hmm. but it is what guided my decisions. And when I became an adult, I kept feeling that there was something missing. I hadn't heard the word vegan, it wasn't popularized yet, and at least not in the United States. And I kept thinking that there was more. So. One day, my sister said to me, if you care about animals so much, then why are you wearing that leather purse? And why are you wearing those leather shoes? And I thought about all the contradictions in my life, and I started putting some pieces together. But it still took time. And years after I had moved out of my parents' home, and I had gone to college, been on my own, I started to realize that there was as much harm in dairy and egg production, if not more, than there was in meat production. And the, the pieces of the puzzle for me ethically started to fit together. And then I started to hear more about the health issues with dairy products and with eggs. And although I was already vegetarian, when I first became vegetarian as a young girl, my mother took me to the doctor, as, as many parents are, are often do when children want to do something radical, con considered radical like that. And fortunately, I had a nice young doctor at that time who was fairly progressive. And my mother wanted the doctor to tell me I was going to die so that I would, if I followed a vegetarian <laughs> diet, so that. I would be convinced not to do it. And the doctor luckily said, you'll be perfectly fine. So I was thrilled. 
but, he added, as long as you eat plenty of eggs and dairy products. And I never cared for eggs and I never cared for cheese, so I had to learn to like them. And then I got hooked, as dairy products are known to do. And when it, ethically, when it came time for me to eliminate those products from my diet, it was a challenge because I had hooked myself on them. But it was also wonderful because the ideology was changing, the scientific uh, research was changing, so that eggs and dairy products were no longer considered essentials on a vegetarian diet. So how many years ago was that? <laughs> that I became vegan? Uh -huh. uh, over 30 years ago, probably close to 32 years That's ago. That's fabulous. You're very, um, not only a book author, but you work with a book publishing company as well. Uh, I know that the book that meant so much to me was the ultimate uncheese cookbook. Just the title alone draw, draw, drew me to it, but at the same time, I was also looking to recreate some sense of the cheese dishes that I grew up loving. So how did that book come about and a little bit about the response to it and maybe even what your favorite simplest recipe is? When I first became vegan and I told people that I was vegan, after I learned how to pronounce the word, <laughs> um, they said to me, I could never do that. I could never give up cheese. And I kept hearing that over and over again. And I realized that for many people, that's the hurdle, giving up cheese. Not even so much dairy products, but cheese. And I realized that there was indeed a need for vegan cheeses because they were not around when the first Uncheese cookbook came out. And that was in uh, the early 90s. And had a lot of experience with nutritional yeast, this odd sounding product that in the 1970s the farm, which is the probably the, the oldest if not only vegan community in the United States, was um, they had discovered that you can get virtually all the nutrients you need on a vegan diet, but B12 was a necessity. And it's a necessity really for everyone. It's one of the few nutrients that we must obtain from our food and that we must supplement with. Even, um, even, even non-vegans and non-vegetarians, I guess because of the more uh, processed foods in the diet? Absolutely. Even though there are minute, uh, minute amounts of vitamin B12, which is really from contamination. It's not a, a vitamin per se. It's found in dirt. Mm -hmm. And so when you eat dirty foods, you can get vitamin B12, but because our food sources are clean and we want them to be clean, B12 is diminished in almost all our foods, even those uh, that are animal-based. So everyone should really be supplementing with vitamin B12. Mm -hmm. And the people on uh, the farm community realized that B12 was essential, but they wanted to find a way to get it from their food. And they found nutritional yeast, which was being used at the time in um, a cheesy-like chip product that contained nutritional yeast in its coating to give it an extra cheesy flavor. Oh. So even though it had dairy products in the coating on the cracker, on the chip, the nutritional yeast boosted that flavor and they discovered somehow also that certain types of nutritional yeast contain vitamin B12 and manufacturers could put that on their labels as, one, as a selling feature. Mm -hmm. Could you describe what nutritional yeast actually is? Nutritional yeast is a primary grown yeast. It's totally different from the kind of yeast that is used to raise bread. Um, it's grown on a molasses medium 
and it's grown for the one purpose only, and that is as a nutritional supplement, but it is grown for its flavor. Unlike brewer's yeast, uh, which is a byproduct of the brewing industry, Torula yeast, which is a byproduct of the paper industry, Nutritional yeast is grown only for this purpose, it's no other purpose at all. Because I think people get it mixed up with brewer's yeast immediately. Well, one problem is that some manufacturers call it brewer's yeast, even though it's nutritional yeast, oh. which is unfortunate and it really confuses consumers. But true brewer's yeast is a byproduct of the brewing industry and it tastes very bitter. It's not something that you want to eat on its own, and it's not something that you want to add to recipes. Mm -hmm. Even though some of the nutrient profile may be similar to nutritional yeast. Nutritional yeast is a yellow, flaky, um, sometimes powdery product that has a cheesy taste. Some people also say it can taste a bit like uh, poultry, so it can you can use it as a chicken substitute if you want to add a chickeny type flavoring to something. But I found that it works fantastically as a substitute for cheese. Not just on its own, but as an ingredient, as a flavor enhancer. Um, so that combined with other ingredients that would give the mouth feel that you can have a cheese-like product that you can make at home very easily. The reason that I mentioned the farm and nutritional yeast is that back in the 70s, they, after they discovered it, they wanted other people to try it too. So they packaged it in these little brown paper bags with a very attractive label with a giant sunshine on it, and they sold it as good tasting yeast in health food stores. Oh, goodness. And uh, that's when I discovered it. So I had been using it for many, many years. And when I decided to create cheese alternatives that would be vegan, I decided to go back to my roots and use nutritional yeast to create that flavor. That's fantastic. I like to put it on popcorn. It's wonderful on popcorn. It gives you that cheesy taste without adding any cheese. It's extremely low in fat. It gives a good protein boost to other uh, foods, even those that are high in protein. It really elevates the whole nutrient profile of whatever you're eating. And it's delicious. In fact, uh, companion animals, dogs and cats, often love it. Oh, really? And it's safe for them, and it adds uh, nutrients to their diet as well. What types of cheeses can be made using your your book? In the Uncheese Cookbook, I have recipes for virtually every kind of cheese that you might want to replicate. You have to understand that they're not going to be identical to dairy cheeses. They're not going to be as hard because they don't have the saturated fat, so they're going to be softer. The best ones to start with are those that are spreads, that are spreadable, or those that are incorporated into other recipes such as a macaroni and cheese, so macaroni with one of my cheese sauces. They're the easiest to make, and most of my recipes overall are actually quite simple. Basically all you have to do for the majority of them is put the ingredients in a blender and blend. Oh, that's a good one. I like that. <laughs> it's very easy. and. Some require you that you have to boil water, <laughs> so if you can boil water and operate a small appliance, you can make almost <laughs> all of my recipes. <laughs> Cheese is the big hurdle for a lot of people, that they just well, can't get past that. Well, one of the reasons is it's, it combines two of the major tastes that are addictive, fat and salt. Mm. The other one is sugar, but with the fat and salt, that's one thing that, we, that the mouthfeel is just so incredible. We just want that mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. And we also like the way cheese makes us feel full. Although for many people it makes it, it, them feel as though they have a lump in their stomach. Mm -hmm. um, and another aspect of cheese that is problematic is that it contains casein, one of the primary proteins in milk. And as uh, Neil Barnard exposed in his book, Breaking the Food Seduction, for which I wrote the recipes, 
He says that casein uh, and cheese and dairy products overall contain casomorphines, which have a similar effect on the body as morphine, the addictive drug. So it's no wonder that people have not only a psychological challenge getting off of cheese, but they also have a physical challenge, a true addiction that may be milder and not as evident as other types of addictions, drug addiction types, but it is a drug addiction. And we are marketed to so fiercely by the dairy industry that we're getting these compelling psychological messages, these compelling emotional messages. We want to have the, the foods that are familiar to us, the ones we grew up with, the ones everyone else is having, the ones that we are being, uh, that are being promoted to us, the ones that the fast food places are selling. Uh, and so we have that emotional, psychological challenge, and we have on top of it that physical challenge. Yes. And also, uh, Dr. Campbell, with the discovering the carcinogen effect of the casein. Yes, absolutely. So, and there are major more health than, damages. More than even pesticides and that sort of thing. That's amazing to think. This, this kind of leads us also into another book, uh, Food Allergy Survival Guide. That. Could you comment just in our closing uh, here what uh, you found to highlight in the need for that book? In the past three decades, food allergies have tripled. So it's not just a phenomenon that seems to be growing, it is growing. And there are many possible reasons why. There are many uh, theories why. And some of them make a lot of sense. One of them is that we live in an extremely clean environment, too clean environment. And so our immune systems have to turn away from those things that it would normally focus on to food. It doesn't have anything else to really build on. So we have an immunological response to food rather than the dirt and bacteria in our environment. And another theory is one that we live in a very polluted world. So we go from too clean to too polluted, that we are affected by pollution and dirt and chemicals and dust and cigarette smoke and chemicals in our food and pesticides and herbicides and on and on. So it is possible that both of these theories are valid. And there is also genetics, but on top of that, there's genetically modified foods, and they contribute to allergic responses oh. as well. The food that we are eating today is not the food that our parents and grandparents ate. So we have to take into account that our bodies were not designed to eat these modified proteins. So interesting. Uh, and the most common that you hear uh, our tree nuts and um, uh, my niece has a pine nut, severe pine nut allergy. Uh, what are some of the others that are more common? Dairy products, eggs, shellfish, wheat and gluten, tree nuts of course. Um, these are among some of the major allergens and peanuts of course that we've we've heard about mm -hmm. um, those are um, creates severe and, and soy is another one uh, much of the soy today has been genetically modified and it's all the more reason to purchase products that do not contain GMO soy and only purchase those that contain organic soy but there is a prevalence of soy, of peanuts, of eggs, and dairy products throughout all processed foods. So we are getting an overexposure yeah. to these items, and that also could be contributing to more food sensitivities overall. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you, Linda. Yeah.